welcome back. Well, let's do a little bit of shooting today with this uh, 257 Roberts. This is a uh, featherweight model. It's a special edition. It was uh, made for the uh, SHOT Show. I think it was about 2012 or 11 or something like that. Um, it's a very special gun to me. Let's see what it will do with uh, 100 grain Sierra Match King bullets. This is a target. This is a target load. Um, not, not to be used for hunting. It's not a... Uh, it's not properly constructed for hunting, but it's a fun load. Um, shoots very nicely usually. Let's see if it does the same thing today. I'm set up at I'm set up at 100 yards. I've got a camera downrange also, so you can see the bullets coming in, and uh, hopefully we'll do all right. It's very hazy out today. Um, very extremely hot and humid. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of rain going through uh, south of us. Uh, and I think just north of us too, so hopefully the weather will stay uh, good. It's still, there's no, uh, there's no wind or any, uh, or any problems like that. The only thing that uh, I've noticed today is that uh, because of the haze and, and the, uh, the conditions, I could get a little, bit of, a little bit more mirage today. But no more excuses, let's see how it shoots. This is a... Uh, a little over 3,000 foot per second with a 100 grain bullet. This is a uh, 2 to 7 loophole, just a VX2. Uh, it's a very, very good scope. Got a little bit of mirage right now because I, I was shooting. Uh, a little while ago to sight it in, make sure I was zeroed, because I was previously zeroed with 75 grain bullets, so. It's a pretty mild shooting load. The 257 Roberts is based on uh, 7mm Mauser case. It's the same case size as the uh, 6mm Remington. This rifle is free-floated from the factory and glass-bedded from the factory. Got the uh, control feed. Hands are slippery today. It's very sweaty. Well, you know, you've often heard that uh, lightweight barrels are not, uh, they're not good varmint barrels, are they? That's what you hear so often. Um, I'd like to fire a fourth one right now and a fifth one, but right now I'm getting a lot of mirage. The target's jumping around a little bit. Maybe I can put another one in there and see. Now it's difficult to hold center of target because of the, um, and this is, this is only a seven power scope, but uh, the target's dancing a little bit. Yeah, these lightweight bull these lightweight barrels can't shoot. Um, you always have if you if you're buying a uh, if you're buying a uh, rifle for supreme accuracy, you you know the the common the common uh, 
thought is that you have to have a heavy barrel varmint or you know you have to have a military grade uh, because nothing else will shoot like that stuff you know don't don't waste your money on a lightweight barrel because they're just uh, you know I mean they're the only thing they have going for them is um, lightweight you can carry them around you know without without slinging any extra weight so uh, I'm just gonna have to wait for that I have to wait for that barrel to cool just a bit because the uh, yeah, we'll do it we'll throw another one in there hopefully I can chase that target on the target bobbling around so. I think I know where the target is. Yeah, these can't shoot. You just can't shoot a lightweight barrel, you know, and they don't they don't compete in the least with a uh, heavy barrel police sniper rifle. So <laughs> It's a great day. I love I love uh, being a spoiler and coming to the internet and telling people all the real truth out there. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of BS, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more back at the farm. Let's see how it does. Uh, swing the I'll swing the camera around so you can see what I was really shooting at. This so you don't think this was a 50 yards away or 25 yards away or something. camera over here. As you can see. Let's throw one more in there. Just for the heck of it. And the other thing you hear about a uh, lightweight barrel is they won't they won't handle too many too many shots in succession. You know they're good for they're only good for three shot groups, but. Uh, I'm not going to spoil that group. I'm going to go for the uh, top right target. That target is really dancing around right now. I guess it would have been in the group. Try one more on that top right target. Yeah, obviously, uh, lightweight, lightweight uh, sporter barrel just can't shoot right. Let's go down, collect the target, and we'll talk about this back home. Well, let's run down the results here. 
Uh, let's see. You have shot one, two, and three in that order, I believe it was. And those three shots right there, they look like maybe a quarter of an inch group to me. Center to center. Uh, let's see. Indeed, almost exactly. The other way you measure it is edge to edge. Extreme edge to extreme edge. I come up with 0.25 for the first three shots. And of course, you know, uh, being the lightweight barrel it is, then it becomes wild when you start shooting uh, more than... Uh, And these measure 0 0.750. That's three quarters of an inch for the full aggregate group. Um, of course, I called. I actually called these. I I said they was mirage. So let's move up to the top of the page here and see what those other shots did that uh, were well beyond the capability of any uh, lightweight barrel. Huh. And see that. Now we have, um, and they're in the center of the group. Uh, in fact, these are smaller than three quarter. Uh, let's see. Outside edge to outside edge, I've got um, 0 0.680. 0 0.680. So. That's uh, that's the way that's the uh, way these poor uh, lightweight barrels shoot. This is a Winchester Model 70, recent manufacturer, made by uh, FN. Um, this gun was made down in South Carolina, I believe, at the uh, plant where they make machine gun barrels. Um, well, let's go ahead and talk this over and see what we got. Well, that was a great day out there. I packed away all the ammo for the day. It's all locked up. And um, I've cleaned up this nice rifle. And uh, my bride made me a nice Manhattan to uh, finish up the day. She's right now watching the uh, Red Sox and the Phillies play. I think they're playing kind of a preview uh, game that uh, might, it might come to be the uh, World Series uh, duo uh, by the looks of things. The Red Sox are doing awesome and the Phillies, I guess, are doing very well. Porcello for the Red Sox, the pitcher just uh, hit a, he just hit a um, double. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's amazing, you know, for pitchers aren't supposed to hit anything, but he hit a nice double. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't bat him in, but at least, uh, at least he, got, he got bragging rights. So let's talk about the equipment today. And I'm kind of, that, that's, really, that's really key to everything here. Um, you saw what the rifle can do. I don't, have to be, I don't have to be glib about it, but this rifle can shoot. And that's the way I expect, I mentioned in one of the other videos, that's the way I expected all my bolt action rifles to shoot ever since I've, ever since I've been shooting them, ever since the mid 60s when I got my first bolt action Seiko uh, L461 action, little miniature action on a 222. They all have shot that way. They, that's just something I expect. And if they don't shoot that way out of the box, I'll get them working that way. Usually it's, 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 it's usually a very simple matter of making sure that I have a two point bedded system on the action and free flowing. And, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you know, while I'm talking about equipment, one of the things that distresses me a lot these days, and this has been this has been getting more and more so uh, as time goes on, because it, it it's an ugliness that tends to feed on itself. I see this in a, a lot of different sports. You know, um, golf. You know, you you 
it has to be it has to be a particular brand of club and you know they'll tell you that their club will drive farther and straighter you know more control than the other guy's club and everything and uh, whoever is whoever is endorsing their uh, golf club or their you know the the shoes that they wear or whatever it is you know they if they weren't if they weren't endorsing that company they happened to get written a con they, they were offered a contract by that company if they had been offered a contract by some other company that's who they'd be endorsing to so you know it has nothing to do with the equipment those guys can drive a ball with they could drive a ball with a teaspoon it really doesn't make any difference uh, and the same was the same with shooting you know there's a gentleman down in Tennessee you've seen him on the internet all the time and I enjoy watching him you know he's um, uh, he got a nice piece of property. He can do all kinds of uh, shooting whenever he wants to and everything. It's kind of a nice dreamy location to do that. Um, and I'd love to be able to do that too. Um, but you know, he, he proves one thing. It's not about the equipment. It's about the shooter. It has nothing to do with the equipment whatsoever. And it has nothing to do with branding of names. And even though he does throw certain names around a lot, uh, that's, that's, that's his prerogative and, and that's fine. But you know, he's proven himself, you know, that he can shoot all the other brands just as equally well. It, does, it has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with the, the brand label on it, the, the emblazoned emblem on it, or anything. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the person's ability to shoot. And all guns these days are made to very high standards. I, I do remember very, very vividly when caveat emptor, that meant buyer be, let the buyer beware. Caveat emptor. That was the that was the uh, phrase of the day back about 20 years ago, 25 years. Well, it might have been more than that. It was the uh, Moss Magnuson Act, I think it was, that came about that required that warranties had to be declared and all that stuff. And that's when that's when companies started having uh, 800 numbers for customer service, so you could start calling in and saying, "Hey, I got a crummy piece of equipment from you, and I want it fixed." Um, Back before that, you know, caveat on tour, basically it meant, sorry buddy, but we're not, you know, we already sold you the gun, what else do you want? If your gun didn't shoot, or if, you know, you had a crack in the stock, I remember I had a, I had a rifle one time that before I, before I even t shot the first shot out of it, I took the, I took the, the barreled action out, and just to make sure that it was, you know, in good shape, and it wasn't, the, the, the recoil surface, the, the walnut uh, recoil surface was split in two. I had to, I called the factory, and uh, I'm not going to mention which company it was because this is back in the 70s. But I called the factory, and uh, after I finally got them on the phone, I kept getting passed from one person to another. Who you know they don't they don't normally in those days they didn't answer phones you you had to somehow find the phone number and and if you you got some executive they they managed to get you this next executive at a lower level and finally you got a secretary who couldn't care less um and i and i simply i simply had to fix it myself and the and the rifle ended up shooting awesome i i epoxied the wood back together but that's the way things were in those days and they aren't that way anymore. They all have customer service numbers that they all have to service you and they will all take care of you. you know, if they, and if they don't, uh, that word gets out very quickly and you can check on that online before you buy any equipment. But I want to be very clear, it is not about a brand name that makes a gun shoot. This happens to be a beautiful Winchester Model 70 with the control speed. Um, it's a basically FN since they bought Winchester, the Winchester brand name. Uh, this is the third, basically, it's the third time it's, uh, the the brand has been around because it, it started out with Winchester repeating arms, and then it went to uh, U.S. Um, all of a sudden, I can't think of the name now. U.S. Uh, something or other. And that, that lasted for so many years, and then, then they, they went under again, and uh, Fabrique National uh, resurrected the uh, label, and um, they're doing a fine job. Uh, this barrel was made in the, uh, this, this rifle and barrel was made down in South Carolina. They're now being made, I guess, in Portugal. And don't trust me. I would buy a, I would buy a gun made in Portugal or any place wherever wherever FN 
decides to have a firearm made, it's being made by FN. It's not being made by any substandard uh, place. Trust me, it's going to be it's going to be correctly made, um, and it's 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 a very very it's a very very good thing that uh, we have firearms that are uh, such high quality. This one happens to be everything that I would do to my own gun. If I if I bought a gun that was not correctly bedded, this is exactly what I'd do with it. Right, this is the way it came out of the box. It's two point two point epoxy bedded, front and rear, not all the way across. You know, I I have people that sneer and snicker because I only two point bed my action. That's an old fashioned system that doesn't work because. That was done years ago before they knew better. If it's fine if you it's, it's fine if you have a big massive receiver, uh, you know, massive receiver, and you have a big massive uh, piece of plastic for stock and everything, and you glue them all together. That's one thing. But you know, when you have when you have a two point bedding system, it's like it's like the it's like the bipod that many people use on the front of a on the front of a rifle. It doesn't rock. It just sits there on two points. So that's a very, very solid system. Running down the list of all the things that this rifle doesn't have, you know, this would be a very boring rifle in today's cult standard when it comes to, uh, when it comes to what a rifle ought to be. A rifle these days, you know, if you haven't noticed, it's supposed to be uh, about a 10 and a half pounds, you know, out of the box before you even put a scope on it. Uh, it's got to have a heavy, it's got to have a heavy bead blasted barrel, uh, you know, a heavy taper, all of, tapered all the way up to the receiver. Uh, and this one here happens to be scalloped and, and, and it's very thin starting right from here and it's got a reduced taper and it only comes to about point, uh, point 0.560 at the, at the muzzle. Now if you do any math, you take 0 0.257 from 0 0.560, you don't have much steel out there. See how much steel is there? Very, very little. It doesn't take any. It doesn't need a lot of steel to have an accurate barrel. And that's one of the that's that's one of the biggest lies out there is that you have to have a lot of steel to have an accurate barrel. That's been going around now for so long that it's um, it, you know it it basically it, it feeds on itself. And a, if you hear a lie long enough, you you believe it, and people. You can't prove you can't you can't prove a negative. So as long as you have everybody out there shooting, you know, small groups with their big barrels, uh, they're not look they're not looking to see if anybody's shooting a small barrel with small groups like me because they're not going to pay attention because they're a bunch of snobs. They won't they won't look at this gun, you know. Right now, before I even launch, I can tell you within within 24 hours, I'll probably have 35 thumbs down because see, I'm a, I'm running against the grain. I'm running I'm I'm running upstream like a like a lively salmon with this stuff, you know, with the truth. And the truth sometimes hurts people. And people who just got done spending you know fifteen hundred dollars for a, for a gun that weighs more than they like to carry around all day. Uh, they're not going to like this because this is this is going against this is going against their truth, you know. Well, the truth is not a relative thing. The truth is a real thing, and this gun can really shoot, and it's that's the truth. Um, and I'll take this head to toe with any with any rifle out there under the same conditions. Now I had a lot of mirage on that fourth shot. By the time I had that fourth shot. That target would bounce. That target was bouncing around all over the place because of the heat influence off the barrel. And the reason I had a lot of heat influence off the barrel was because things were getting ready to rain, and I wanted to get the thing shooting. And I had just got done sighting it in after uh, having it loaded up for 75 grain VMAX bullets, which were a totally different point of impact. So uh, within within 10 minutes, I was already shooting off a gun barrel that was quite warm. So. But despite the fact that I was shooting under handicap conditions, it shot very well. But again, this this goes totally against the book. The book requires it has to have a heavy barrel. It has to be, and preferably it should be bead blasted. It's got to have that military police look.
I was a cop and I was in the military, you know, and, and when I was in the military, you know, they didn't, have, this was the look right here. When the guys, when the guys had their Model 70 Winchesters afield in Vietnam and the Model 700 Remington, and I saw them both over there, um, and some of them, you know, the, the Model 70s, they, they were, they were brought back into battle. They had been already used in, in uh, you know, Second World War. So, you know, these guns last a long time, um, and they, you don't have to have, you don't have to have bead, blasted, finish. Heaven's sakes, if I go afield, you know what this, you know what this gun looks like in the woods? This is wood. It just looks, it looks like the woods. You know that? And you know what this black barrel looks like? It looks like all the black branches that are in the trees. It's the most natural looking thing in the world to see a wooden stock in a wooded woods. Fascinating. I don't have to camouflage paint it. I don't have to, I don't have to use the right, you know, I don't have to stipple the finish so that the sun doesn't glint off it or anything like that. And, you know, the stock is uh, polyurethane. You know, they sometimes will say it's a oil, you know, it ha has an oil-like finish or something like that. It's, it's, it's urethane. They haven't used, they haven't used oil on uh, factory uh, made rifle stocks for many, many years because that, that's a military thing. They use linseed oil on military grade rifles because for one thing it was cheap, it was very fast, they didn't have to have a drying room for it, they just slathered it on with a brush and they threw it, they, they threw it in a rack and that was it. They didn't have to worry about it, it dried on, it dried on the way to the armory. So these are urethane finish, um, you know, you can you can add a you take a, a foam brush and add a little bit more urethane to the inside of the barrel channel if it if it looks like it's not as uh, heavy, uh, you know. And that's all you need to do. And this I've had I've had rifles like this all my life, and I've had them out in rainstorms. I've had them out in, in blizzards and everything else, and they come back just fine. You know, you do as you do with everything else. You know, just like your socks. You know, you just you just bring it in and, and dry the thing off. That's all. Um, you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a, sorry, uh, Colonel Cooper, but you don't have to have a, a you know, detachable box magazine uh, because, you, you know, if you got an accurate rifle, you get one shot, you put your ammo down, and that's it. You use the other two or three shots to call your friends, let them know that you got an animal down on the ground. You don't need to have a whole bunch of shots. Um, it's got a nice, it's got a nice, a good field rifle should have a nice, Oh, that's a beautiful trigger. That's a two and a half pound, two and a half pound. This is the MOA trigger they call it, which is a revision of the old Model 7 trigger. Instead of being a, instead of being a simple lever, this is a cam actuated. This is a cam actuated trigger. So it's, it's got a um, comes to an absolute dead stop. There's no over travel whatsoever. Steel floor plate, steel. Steel follower right here. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, just the same way that Paul Mauser designed them in 1898. Control feed bolt. And if I'm if I'm hyping Model 70s, I can't help it. They're just beautiful guns. Um, they're just beautiful guns. They shoot. You know, it's it's the it's the rifleman's rifle. But any. More than anything else, I want to I want to illustrate that a, a good sporter rifle should be just exactly that. It should be a good sporter rifle. It should be designed for the purpose of sport hunting. Military police sniper rifles are not meant for sport shooting. They were meant for for one thing to extract as much money out of your out of your paycheck with your tax dollars as they possibly could. Because you know when when you're a, when you're a police when, when you're a, when you're a police buying uh, agent in a department, uh, you know your boss tells you uh, we need we need a couple of sniper rifles. Go down to the store and see what you can find. You know what you find? You find the you know the checkbook is open. You know you write you you write whatever number it is that you need. That's the way those things go, and that's the way the government buys stuff. And they you know. The colonels and the generals, they really don't, they really don't mind your checkbook that very well. And that's why, that's why our current president is kind of, 
you know, he's kind of smoothing the seams a little bit and he's watching those pennies like nobody else had ever watched them before. And, you know, if, if you got to, if anybody hasn't told you yet, the point of a good rifle is to be able to fire a good shot when you need it. Not a whole group of shots, a good shot when you fire. And if you looked at that target, you rerun this back, look at that target and see where that first bullet hole struck. I'll wait. Did you see it? Right dead in the middle. Now, I wouldn't normally have my, I wouldn't normally have my uh, rig uh, set up so that it's driving the first bullet at 100 yards into the middle of the target. I was showing off. I wanted you to show that I could bisect the, I could bisect the crosshairs with the bullet hole, and that's what that's what the name of the game is. And if you can do that with this rifle here, you don't need to have a military and police sniper rifle that weighs four or five pounds more and costs six or eight hundred dollars more and you don't need to have a, a 30 millimeter tube on it because that all that does is it gives you increased elevation and windage for extreme long range shooting if, if that's your game that's fine but you can put that 30 millimeter tube on this gun if you don't think that this gun can also shoot at extreme range i got news for you I, you know that you know a gun that will shoot very, very small groups at 100 yards will shoot very, very small groups at 3, 4, 5, 800, 900, or 1,000 yards. It doesn't make any difference. It's still shooting very small groups. The, um, the cartridge I was using, the 257 Roberts, uh, that's, not a, that's not a renowned target cartridge. You'll never see anybody, you know, except for maybe some, some guy like me, maybe, who's a, you know, a cult fan of the thing. You're never going to see a guy like uh, taking a 257 Roberts to a bench rest match. But you know, with the right, with on the right day, with the right bullets, that that gun can do pretty good in the sport of class. And field shooting is not a bench rest match. You're not shooting groups. I've mentioned that. You're not shooting groups. You need to have a rifle that will accurately lay your first shot where it wants to go. And if you need to, you can lay three, four, five shots exactly where they need to go. If you happen to be a field and you happen to see, you know, uh, six or seven uh, hogs off at a distance or something, and you want to put them all down, don't you think this is going to do it? I guarantee you it will. Um, and it will do it with a plum. And not only that, but it's going to do it without me getting tuckered out before the end of the day. Free floating the stock should be a, it should be five credit, it should be five business cards of clearance. This, that's what it comes from with the fat, from the factory and it's a discreet amount. It doesn't look like a big, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it has to be a big gaping wound, but I can, there's 50 thousandths of an inch. In other words, each business card is 10 thousandths of an inch. So I can, I can lay five business cards around that uh, barrel and that'll, that'll give me a perfect clearance. And that's what you need to have. You need to have a barrel which is able to vibrate like a tuning fork so that when you have the correct load in it, that'll always vibrate exactly the same with every shot. You don't want to have a barrel that collides with the wood and you don't ever, ever, ever want to lay anything even the slightest twig against this barrel because if you upset that vibration you're going to throw your shot significantly. You can throw your shot as much as six or seven inches by just applying finger pressure to that barrel when it goes off because the changes the vibrations, the nodes and overtones, that barrel that barrel is undulating and it's, it's got two, it has two degrees of vibration. It has a, it has a, a first a first stage which is basically the whole barrel is vibrating and it's got another one which is it's got nodes and overtones and it's, it's flowing like a wave so those are those are the two conditions of vibration they have to they have to work independently of the rest of the gun um, good trigger you know two and a half to three pound trigger pull um, nice solid walnut doesn't need to have pillar bedding I never, you know, I pillar bedded two walnut stocks in my life and it didn't do a thing. I, I tested before and I tested them afterwards and it didn't do anything to, to help them. And the reason is because walnut is very, very dense. Good wood is very, very dense and it's selected to be dense. And it means that when you, when you cramp that 
action screw home, it comes to a dead stop and you're lucky if you can get another five minutes on a clock out of it because there's nothing, there's nothing that's going to keep on crushing. There's no crush fit. It's going to stop dead just like it was a cast iron frying pan. When you have squishy wood, that's because I can, I can tell you that somebody was busy doing what I see so frequently done now is drizzling oil into the action. There's nothing here to drizzle oil into. This is my, this is my oil right here. That's all I oil this, this rifle with. I can, take this stock, I can take this out of the stock. I can take the action out. If I've been out on a wet day, if it's been raining, I take the action out and I wipe the whole thing off. I clean it up with mineral oil, uh, mineral spirits rather first to make sure I have any dirt off it. Then I just take this oily flannel and I wipe it down. That is the extent of my oil. And I'm sorry, but that's all I put on. I'm not going to put, you've never seen me put a drop of oil in any place in that action. Never. Never. That's death on that wood. Oil finish on a stock is not motor oil. It is not gun oil. Oil finish on a stock is linseed oil. It's a plant. It's a, it's, it has nothing to do whatsoever with lubricating oils. Linseed oil is something you don't want to be getting into a gun because linseed oil will basically, it gets gummy and will harden. If it's boiled linseed oil, it basically hardens like uh, varnish. So, uh, you know, don't get, don't get your terms mis, you know, misconstrued. Your scope, if you're putting together a good field rifle, your scope should be as low a power as you possibly can get away with. And I mentioned this in the scope selection video. You never, ever pick a scope by its high power. You pick a scope by its low power. You go from the low power end. And when I say that, what I'm driving at is that you want to have a a lot of field of view. You want to have as much field of view as you possibly can get out of that, uh, as much as you can get out of that scope as you can. I have never once in my entire life needed to have additional magnification on a scope, ever. I don't remember ever having, I've, I've, walked, out into, I've walked out into power lines and I've looked down them and I've almost forgotten that I could turn the thing up to, you know, five or seven power because if you can bisect you can bisect a deer at 400 yards with a two power scope that's the way it goes you know it's just you, if you can see if you can see the deer with your naked eye you know at two power that's twice as much and you put a crosshair through it that's all you do so it's not a matter of having high power you know intelligent hunters years ago would never buy a high power scope it was all they would always buy a one or a one and a half power scope that was what they bought for the field before they came out with variable power because that's what they needed they had they all they wanted to do was have a cross here and when you're in the woods when you're up close you know up close and personal with deer that are only 15 yards away you know really within you know softball throwing distance when they're that close and you bring the scope up and all you see is it looks like tree trunks and they're just branches because it magnifies everything and then when you finally see the deer you really can't see them clearly because the scope a three power scope does not focus down that well at 15 yards one of the worst possible lies it's a very offensive thing one of the worst possible lies that goes around out there is that a three to nine power is the best all-around scope that's the worst. That's the worst magnification that was ever invented. It has absolutely no application whatsoever in the world. I bought a three to nine one time a, f a couple of years ago to go on my AR-15 so I could test ammo because I could get the thing for $175 on sale. It was a VX1, and it's a marvelous scope to put on top. I can test my ammo. I can take it off, and I can use my my peep sight. Or someday, if I want to go into the you know the class where they're now allowing you to shoot uh, with scopes up to four and a half power. I'll get a four and a half power scope for it, thank you very much, but that three to nine, that is the most hideous. If you put your scope at the lowest power and you go out in the woods, you can't see a thing, absolutely nothing. And there's not much better in the field because your, your field of view is extremely constrained. There's nothing there. So, you know, if you see a deer going across the field that he's jumping across the field and you're trying to find him with that foolish scope at three power, you'll never do it. And if you happen to have it screwed up to nine power, you're just completely dead.
that is the worst power and so all the sums down are going to be coming now because everybody out there, I'm, I'm talking to people who, you know, they got 4 to 14 and 5 to 25 and it goes up the charts. So this is, this is the great lie that has been perpetuated upon the American shooting public. And you see it plastered all over the catalogs. You know, you, there's, there's the guy coming out of the woods, he's got moss coming out of his teeth and, he, you know, eight days growth of beard with, with a rack hanging out of his backpack and everything else. And you can see the, you can see the, uh, the Rockies behind him and all that stuff. The guy was probably a model that they got off of Fifth Avenue to, you know, to pose in this thing and, and they, put a, they, they put a wool cap on his head and everything and made him look like a mountain man. But I can guarantee you that no intelligent mountain man that I ever knew would ever go out in the woods with the kind of scope that he has mounted on his thing with a 50 millimeter front end on it and, you know, weighing, weighing three pounds worth of scope sitting on a, you know, 10 pound rifle with a, with a you know, a Cobra sling on it. That is not a field shooting rifle, and it's not going to get him his game any better. You know, it, it, he's he's got the same limitation that I have when I go out of field, when I go into the Rocky Mountains or wherever I happen to be. It's exactly the same limitation. I don't let moss grow in my teeth though, because I don't have that many. You got to keep it simple. You know, it, it, let let the advertisers try to sell you whatever they want to sell you. Let me guide you as to what you really need to have and don't let, let all the hyperbole, don't let all the internet chatter and don't let the glossy magazine ads and everything else spell for you what you need to get because you don't need any of that stuff. You don't need a 30 millimeter tube, you don't need to have a 50 millimeter front end. This is a 33 millimeter front end and like I say, this is the highest power scope that I would ever buy for a field rifle. Highest power and that would be this would be my western rig right here. This is my ideal western rig. I could carry this thing around all day long, slung over my shoulders, or I could carry it in my in, in my fist. Uh, you know, it's it's a gun that it's a gun that weighs barely eight pounds with the sling on it, and that's a grand sling. What a delightful sling that is to carry, and it's a delightful sling to buy because this sling only costs fourteen ninety five. Uh, it's available from any any place online. Always get a Garand sling and never an AR-15 or M-16 sling because those those slings, my friend, are too long. They they're actually longer than the Garand sling. So you have to have you have to have a Garand sling. And you see, if you happen to see a pronghorn that's way out at at 350 yards, and you just quietly get swung up like that. You get into your nice kneeling position, and you got yourself you got yourself a nice pronghorn. And you know you don't have to have, and you don't want to have two and a half pounds of Harris bipod contraption sitting under your rifle because you learn to shoot, and you don't need to have that stuff. God gave you Harris bipods. He gave you two of them on your front end, and he gave you two of them on your bottom end, and that's that's what you wear. You know, you don't need to put it on your gun. What else can I talk about that you need to know about your 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 rig? Like I said in uh, the other video about scopes, if you're if you're a woods hunter one power at the bottom end or as close as you can get to it and don't let the guy at Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop tell you that those are those scopes are not they're not recommended for anything because that is what I'm recommending you want to have low power scope for the woods if you're going out of field for very long range stuff yeah you can get yourself a two to seven power scope and like this is here because see I'd I'd be using this I'd also be using this rig at the end of the day after I got my pronghorn and my mule day mule deer on the third or fourth day I'd be going out prairie dog shooting and that's what I use the 7 power for because with the 7 power scope I'll go back to the range sighted in with some 75 grain uh, bullets for a prairie dog shooting and I got myself a dandy prairie dog rig but you say that this isn't powerful enough for prairie dogs well I guess what that's why I, I've shot all my prairie dogs after the after the hunt was with a 7 power scope on my 270 no less you know 
um, you don't need to have a lot of power when you when you you know my first my first scope was an M8 Leupold back in 1964 on my Seiko L461 uh, Seiko Vixen and um, I dusted an awful lot of New England woodchucks with that out to range of 375 yards you know with a with a that's a seven and a half power fixed power scope and that was before all the advancements that Leupold has put in them since more advanced coatings and all that stuff that was a one fine one fine scope and that was probably less advanced than even the VX1 is these days this is a VX2 scope you don't you don't have to have a lot of money in your scope and m more money does not guarantee more precision sorry anybody who out, who's out there that thinks that they got to spend 1200 or 2000 or 3000 dollars for a scope to get a precision scope I think I just showed you that that's not necessarily true. What you need to have is uh, simply accuracy. You know, you say, why do we have heavy barrel varmenters then? Well, I'll tell you where heavy barrel varmenters came from. Heavy barrel varmenters were the first, that was, that was the first solution to a problem. Back in the, back in the early days, uh, back in the early days of, uh, I'm talking about post-war, post-World War II era, when a lot of uh, like New England woodchuckers and things like that, and Western rock chuckers wanted to have more accurate guns, they, they really couldn't they really couldn't get much out of what they had in those days, um, and they had a lot of they had a lot of problems with bad you know, poor bullet manufacturers. Uh, factory ammo was lousy. They were handloading their own because the, the, the factory ammo was bad. Um, the biggest problem was that they did not have stress relieved barrels. Stress relieving technology had not yet come about. Uh, it was it was probably 25 or 30 years off in the future, and even that has been improved even in the last in the last eight or ten years, where stress relieving now is done more frequently by more manufacturers for their standard run of the mill uh, off the shelf uh, rifles that they put in boxes and, and, and sell down at Walmart. Stress relieving is more common now because, for one thing, they understand it's not a, it's not an expensive thing to do. It's basically heating the steel. I think it's about 650 degrees Celsius or something like that. Heating that steel up corrects a problem. Residual stress is what occurs in a, a gun barrel when it's machined. When it's machined, <coughs> heat occurs at the at the point of machining. And uh, even with even with the oil baths and everything else, there's still there's still surface friction there that, uh, that that heats that steel to a degree that will change the it changes the temper of the the, the, the barrel head. Remember, it's been already forged or whatever, uh, and uh, this happens to be a hammer forged barrel, so it's hammer forged around a mandrel, which helps reduce some of that issue because it doesn't have to be machined as many times. But when it's uh, various cutting operations. You know, the, the first initial boring. Then it has to be. Then it has to be rifled, button rifled, or broach rifled, cut rifling. Uh, you know, all those different processes. Those all create stress on the top of that steel, which is different than the underlying steel. The underlying steel stays cooler, and then the differences in the there's differences in that activity as the barrel changes its dimension and uh, goes to a smaller taper because. You know this this barrel here, this part of the barrel here is going to heat differently during cutting than the heavier part of the barrel and the chambering and all that. So and the crowning operation. So every time that occurs, it it, cre it creates density problems, which is called uh, stress in the in the barrel. And it's not it 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 kind of acts on it kind of acts on steel the way. Uh, stress in a, a plank, a wood plank will act. You know, the carpenter is familiar with. If you, if you have a band, if you have a, a table saw, and you're splitting a, ripping a piece of wood down the middle, if it has any stress in it, it's either going to splay like this in two different directions, or it's going to cramp around the blade and bind the blade. So, with steel, there is residual stress that will cause issues. That will cause the barrel, as it starts to heat up, it'll cause the barrel to start uh, warping. 
Heavy barrels simply uh, warped less and they, they, they received less influence of stress during the manufacturing process at the initial stages. So it helped them both ends. The, the heavy barrel machined better to begin with. It, it was less affected. It had, a, it, in other words, it, it's a better heat sink. So it had, it had less stress to begin with during the manufacturing process. And then after the manufacturing process, when it was being shot, five to 10 shots, that heavy barrel uh, was less influenced by uh, the, the heat uh, that was within. And so the residual stress is built up a lot uh, more slowly. Lightweight barrels tended to curl pretty quickly uh, during, during those processes. And so, um, you know, they, they, they did have a tendency to wander after the third shot, especially after the third shot, because then the barrel, you know, I, I should say third shot, not, not you know, uh, over a long period of time, but third shot in succession. Then you'd see that that barrel would start to throw the fourth and fifth shot and they'd go different places on the paper. And that's because the barrel was literally uh, cramping and twisting. But now we, have, now we have manufacturers that understand this residual stress issue. And so they're doing all kinds of heat treating and even now cryogenic uh, cold treating where they bring it down to super, super cold temperatures, which effectively does the same thing. It, 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 it calms that steel, removes that residual stress. And it kind of unifies, it unifies the steel so it all has the same level of tempering inside. So that's one of the things that has really changed in the last few years. And that's why you can have this little pencil thin barrel shooting every bit as good as uh, a heavy barrel. Now one thing it does not do is, and this has nothing to do with the field shooter, but for a bench rest shooter, for somebody who's, you know, trying to, trying to shave off that third decimal point behind the, you know, the third decimal behind the decimal point. He's trying to beat a guy by a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch. Quietness is the, that's the issue that they're looking for. And I'm not talking about decibel levels. I'm not talking about the sound of the gun going off. I'm talking about the quietness of the gun at, as it responds to the, the uh, various vibrations uh, set up by the trigger when the when the trigger finally comes back and the sear lets go that's one stage of it that's the first stage of uh, noise within the gun the second one is when the, the the firing pin is driving forward you know is that there's that spring tension and it, that there's a recoil factor in that you know there's that there's a firing pin that's uh, there's a firing pin that's being thrown forward by a, by a very dense spring and that's, that's an issue which causes significant vibration. You don't feel it, but it's there. And, uh, you know, a group can see it. And it also, having the heavy barrel, will basically add mass and weight to the gun so that the gun doesn't tend to move around when the guy's pulling the trigger. And bench rest shooters, a lot of them, they develop their own techniques about um, you know, keeping things quiet. A lot of them, you'll see, they'll they'll pinch the trigger. They don't even want to pull. They they don't even get near the buttstock because they they don't really want to influence the rifle in any way. They have they have everything is all mechanical. You know, they they do everything they possibly can to stay within the rules. It's sitting there on the sandbags. Everything weighs a ton, and they just simply pinch their two their two and a half ounce trigger right here. They just pinch it from the the back of the trigger guard like that so that they're not pulling on the gun. So everything is everything is designed to induce quietness and that's the primary thing that uh, a heavy barrel environment can do for a, for a person who's in the bench rest competition game or long range uh, you know thousand yard matches and stuff like that but it has nothing to do that is not a, an issue of the slightest degree for the hunter. There is no such there's so, there's no such issue that's gonna uh, either get you or fail to get you your game at the end of the day. Uh, this gun is more than quiet enough. When I get into a military when I get into a military position with just a hasty sling like that, this gun is more than quiet enough to get off my shot and to have a and to have my game at the, at the end of the day. And that's all it's about. So those are the big things. Don't worry about a don't worry about a pretty rifle, and don't let anybody snicker at you because you got wood. 
wood is beautiful. You know, God created that. It's not, it didn't come out of a, do you know how many operations that this had to go through? I'll bet you 50 people touched that wood, or, or touched some part of that tree before it uh, turned into a stock. That had to be cut down in the wilderness someplace. Uh, had to be, it had to be logged out, probably driven several hundred, maybe a, maybe a thousand miles before it got to its destination, you know, to the sawmill. Somebody had to stand there at the end of a grading table, somebody with a trained eye, you know, usually it's some guy who's older than me, you know, with a pipe and all that and an old fedora, and he'll be standing there and he'll be flipping all those planks over and grading them with a yellow chalk or something. And when he runs across the right one, he says, oh, this one here is good for gun stocks. And he has a gun stock pile because that has to be great wood. It has to be very straight grained. It has to be very dense wood. And that's, that selection process then goes to the factory. Then some guy who has a template with a tr another trained eye, he has to be able to lay out. He's the layout guy. He has to lay out all those stocks and uh, have them come out so that all the so that all the grain runs true, uh, so there's no curly grain that's going to warp that front end and everything. Because all these shots, this gun has now celebrated, I think, about 500 rounds. I've gone through five. I know that I've gone, I save all my empty boxes. I've gone through five boxes of 257 bullets since I bought this rifle. So uh, that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty nice uh, thing to know that this rifle is still shooting every bit as good as the first group I ever fired out of. The very first group I fired out of was a four tenths of an inch, five shot group. Um, the first load, it was just a random load that I made up from the book. Um, so, you know, and, and, I've, and I've many times said, you never find me getting any kind of caustic crap near this, inside of this barrel, never. Ne you will not see me putting copper remover in this barrel. That's the way this goes. Co anything, you know, copper is more noble than steel. If you, if you, if you throw a copper pipe into, uh, you know, salt water for a decade or two, you'll find a green copper pipe at the end of the decade or two. You throw, you throw a gun barrel in there, uh, you won't have to wait, you won't have to wait a decade, you won't have to wait a 10 days and you're going to have a, a ruined barrel. Copper is far more noble, and anything that will remove copper from a barrel is going to be removing barrel material first. Trust me, it really will. And I'm speaking from experience because I ruined, I ruined a good Seiko 270 barrel by using uh, a caustic agent to remove copper. That was in my stupid days. Uh, you'll never see me do that again. You don't want to have, I've mentioned this before, you don't, you don't want to have, you don't want to have a, a pristine steel lined barrel you want to have a nicely you want to have a nicely conditioned barrel this is that this is that that stuff that you hear about is called breaking in a barrel that sound familiar breaking in a barrel is conditioning it with copper and so after you after you've conditioned it with copper and broken it in then you've got to go buy the stuff that strips the copper out so you start free from scratch one again and that's why this rifle will shoot the first shot out of a cold, clean bore exactly into the center of the group. I don't, I, I, when I wash this barrel out with mineral spirits, or if I like to smell hoppies, mineral spirits work better than hoppies actually. But if I, if I clean this barrel out, flush it out with mineral spirits with a swab and, and a light, uh, a light uh, application with a, a bronze brush and clean it out, this gun will shoot the first shot into that same group. And every rifle I have will shoot the first shot into that same group. It always will because I don't strip the copper out. That's, that's that conditioning. You want to leave it in there. It makes the barrel nice and smooth. And that's the way the barrel wants to be from shot to shot to shot. You want to keep it that nice smooth finish inside. You don't have copper fouling. If you have copper fouling, it's because you've been abusing your barrel and you've been shooting it too quickly and too, too much. And, you know, I, I have not seen, I've never, in, in, my, in my life, the only copper foul barrels I've seen are military barrels that have been, you know, in military conditions. And I, I'm not going to put my barrel through that sort of thing, thank you very much. So have a nice, make sure your, your crown is in good condition. This is a nice, nice, beautiful crown they put on that. Um, nice crown. 
nice slender barrel, easy to carry over hill and dale, just as accurate as possibly can be. I mean, that'll put three, three shots into a, a quarter of an inch, three, the first three shots into a quarter of an inch, and then things started getting fuzzy on me, and the target's flipping around because I have a lot of heat coming off the barrel because I had just sighted in the rifle five, ten minutes before I went on camera. But if, if I hadn't, if I, if, if I still had the same sight picture, I would have probably put the other, the other shots into the same exact hole. Uh, nothing changes with this gun from one shot group to another. So, don't buy into all the hype and all the baloney. Get yourself a nice, inexpensive Garand sling that is functional. And the reason it's functional is because the Army and the Marine designed it to be functional. They designed it to be able to, you know, to get the job done at the end of the day. And that's why this works so nicely. Um, don't, don't be afraid of wood. If you like a wood stock, get a wood stock. It's nice and warm, you know. There's nothing that feels warmer than natural wood. You, know, pl you can never get plastic. It'll never, it'll never temper like that. It never feels that nice in your hands and on a cold morning. It'll get, it'll get frosty feeling. Uh, no matter what you do with it, you don't have the same nice feel as checkering. You can stipple, you can stipple, you can pebble, you can do whatever you want with plastic. You still got stippled, pebbly plastic. It doesn't feel like that, and it doesn't look that beautiful, and it doesn't it doesn't hide in the woods as well as this does. This nothing hides in the woods like wood. That's what it does. Nothing's as quiet as a nothing is as quiet as a cotton sling in the woods, and nothing is as light and nothing is as effective, and nothing is as accurate as this rifle. All right. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, tell all your friends about us, shoot safely, and God bless.